Hello, this is History for Today again. We're back with the first chapter of my U.S. History 2 survey, and now I want to talk about wealth inequality. Industrial capitalism produced the greatest advances in efficiency and productivity that the world had ever seen. Giant corporations were able to marshal capital on an unprecedented scale to produce affordable consumer products, which benefited buyers and they earned profits and created unheard of fortunes. But mass production also created millions of low paid, unskilled and unreliable jobs with long hours and dangerous working conditions. Industrial capitalism launched the United States into what's called the Gilded Age of inequalities that challenged American ideals of life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness being available to all. Americans. The sudden appearance of the extreme wealth of industrial and financial leaders alongside the crippling poverty and squalor of the urban and the rural poor shocked Americans. This association of poverty with progress is the great enigma of our times, said economist Henry George in his 1879 bestseller Progress and Poverty. The great financial and industrial titans who were called robber barons by their critics included railroad investors such as Leland Stanford who gave his name to a university in California, Jay Gould, Cornelius Vanderbilt, oil men such as John D and William Rockefeller, steel magnates such as Andrew Carnegie and Henry Frick, and bankers such as Jay Cook and then John Pierpont Morgan. These businessmen amassed fortunes that adjusted for inflation are still among the largest that America has ever seen. And they congratulated themselves for their superior ability. Andrew Carnegie wrote an essay that became known as the gospel of wealth to justify his fortune. According to measurements of contemporaries at the time, in 1890, the wealthiest 1% of Americans owned one-fourth of the nation's assets, and the top 10% owned over 70%. As the Gilded Age progressed, the robber barons widened head starts that they had often achieved only with government help. Railroad companies, for example, had been provided government-backed financing to build their transcontinental tracks and land grants totaling 175 million acres. That's an area about equal to the state of Texas. Bankers had benefited from national banking laws that consolidated finance and credit in New York. The government and the railroads that it financed were the steel industry's biggest customers. Standard Oil employed predatory pricing made secret deals with railroads on freight costs, and the government looked the other way, while the Ohio Company became a trust that controlled over 90% of the oil refining in America. By 1900, the richest 10% of Americans controlled perhaps 90% of the nation's wealth. This is a map that was used by the Democratic Party in its national campaign of 1884, complaining about the amount of public land that was given to the railroads. The map shows, at the time, 139 million acres of the people's land given by Republican Congresses and the Republican administration to railroad corporations. At the time, this was more land than was contained in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Indiana combined. The Democrats believed that this was an issue, and it turns out that for many people, it was. As these vast fortunes accumulated among a small number of very wealthy Americans, new ideas were employed to bestow moral legitimacy on them. In 1859, the British naturalist Charles Darwin had published his theory of evolution through natural selection called On the Origin of Species. By the 1870s, Darwin's theory had gained widespread traction among biologists, naturalists, and other scientists in the United States and had begun to challenge the political and social and religious beliefs of many Americans. One of Darwin's most influential popularizers 
the British sociologist and biologist Herbert Spencer applied Darwin's theory to society and popularized the phrase survival of the fittest. Although Spencer's assumption that human society worked by the same laws as nature was flawed and incorrect, the idea took hold. The fittest people, Spencer said, would demonstrate their superiority through economic success in a free market. Sound familiar? State welfare and private charity that prevented the unfit from failing would be bad for society and would lead to social degradation by encouraging the survival of the weak. The wealthy and their defenders made the most of this social Darwinism, as it became known. There must be complete surrender to the law of natural selection, the Baltimore Sun journalist H.L. Mencken wrote in 1907. All growth must occur at the top. The strong must grow stronger, and that they may do so, they must waste no strength in the vain task of trying to uplift the weak. Social Darwinists believed that they had identified a natural order that extended from the laws of the cosmos to the workings of industrial society. All species and all societies, including modern humans, the theory claimed, were governed by a relentless competitive struggle for survival. For social Darwinists, the inequality of outcomes that led some to become wealthy while others starved should not merely be tolerated, but should be encouraged and celebrated. Inequality signified the progress of species and societies. Spencer's major work, Synthetic Philosophy, sold nearly 400,000 copies in the United States by the time of his death in 1903. Gilded Age industrial elites, such as Andrew Carnegie, Thomas Edison, and John D. Rockefeller, were among Spencer's prominent followers. Even some American thinkers, such as Yale sociologist William Graham Sumner, echoed these ideas. Sumner said, before the tribunal of nature, a man has no more right to life than a rattlesnake. He has no more right to liberty than any wild beast. His right to pursuit of happiness is nothing but a license to maintain the struggle for existence. Pretty bleak. Although Sumner seemed to be implying that most strivers would never achieve their goals, many Americans tried to focus on the positive. Massachusetts author Horatio Alger promoted the popular image of rags to riches success in stories like his bestseller, Ragged Dick. Even though there were very few actual examples of poor boys rising to wealth and social status simply by honesty and hard work, the possibility of achieving the goals of life, liberty, and happiness was kept alive in what became known as the Horatio Alger myth. Not everybody welcomed inequality so eagerly, however. The spectacular growth of the U.S. economy and the ensuing inequities in living conditions and incomes worried many Americans. But as industrial capitalism overtook the nation, it bought political protection. Although both major political parties believed that state power should support the interests of capital against labor, big business looked primarily to the Republican Party. The party, you might remember, had been formed as a coalition of an anti-slavery, free soil faction that was committed to free labor and the Whig Party, who were ardent supporters of American business. Abraham Lincoln had been a corporate lawyer who had defended railroads, and he had been a Whig congressman before joining the Republican Party. During the Civil War, the Republican government led mostly by former Whigs in the coalition, took advantage of the wartime absence of Southern Democrats to push through a pro-business agenda. The Republican Congress gave millions of acres and millions of dollars to railroad companies. Republicans became the party of business, and they dominated American politics throughout the Gilded Age and the first decades of the 20th century. Of the 16 presidential elections between the Civil War and the Great Depression, Republican candidates won all but four. In the generation after the war, 
the Democratic Party was remembered as the party of slavery who were responsible for the war. And Republicans regularly discredited Democratic candidates by, as it was called at the time, waving the bloody shirt and reminding voters of the war. Republicans controlled the Senate in 27 out of the 32 sessions in that same period. Republicans used their control of government to enact high protective tariffs designed to shield American businesses from foreign competition. Southern planters had vehemently opposed tariffs before the war because they were a raw material producer, producing cotton for British textile mills and buying manufactured products. But after the war, they could do nothing to prevent their increase. The Dingley tariff passed in 1896 by President William McKinley was even higher than the tariff McKinley had written himself a few years earlier as a congressman. It remained in effect for 12 years, and it imposed duties on foreign goods that averaged 52%, the highest tariffs in American history. Tariffs provided the protective foundation for a new American industrial order. While Spencer and his social Darwinism provided the moral justification for national policies that minimized government interference in the economy for anything other than protection and support of business. So before we continue, some questions for you to think about. Why did inequality between the rich and the poor in America increase so much during the Gilded Age? Secondly, was social Darwinism an effective justification of inequality? And finally, how plausible was the Horatio Alger myth of rags to riches success? Why was it so popular?